Welcome. We're here in the Goldman School uh, living room uh, at the University of California at Berkeley with Professor Amy Lerman, who's a member of the Goldman School faculty. And we're going to talk about the reputation of government and why people think government can't get things done and why that's a problem. So, Professor Lerman, you're in the midst of writing a book and have actually published a lot of articles about how there's a reputation problem for government in America. What's the reputation problem? After all, a lot of people just think and maybe even believe and maybe even know that government doesn't work. So is it a reputation problem or a performance problem? It's a little bit of both, I think. But the reputation piece has received less attention. And mm -hmm. I think there are important ways in which the reputation of government contributes to the fact that government can't get much done. So I think about this as kind of similar to a reputation crisis in private industry. Mm -hmm. So you get a company that has a um, sort of a decent reputation, is doing well, and then something happens that, um, that consumers notice. So this could be um, a company that produces a product that doesn't sell particularly well or is disappointing. This could be a corruption scandal. Um, it could be any number of things, but it affects how people think about the company. And part of what happens is then the reputation becomes a stereotype. So it doesn't matter then if the company is able to regain its footing and do things well again. Uh, what happens is people continue to assume that the company doesn't do well. And part of the problem then is consumers stop purchasing whatever it is the company produces, and that then makes it more difficult for the company to continue to operate at a, at a significant level of quality. So with respect to government, where do we have reputation problems that are uh, especially important and significant? Yeah, so I think it, uh, you know, we've seen since the 1960s that there's been a massive decline in citizens' trust in all kinds of institutions, mm -hmm. particularly government. And that comes from any number of places. It comes from the Vietnam War, it comes from the Nixon uh, administration, it comes from increasing concern about inefficiency and waste mm -hmm. and uh, concern about the increasing scope of government. And I'm not arguing that we don't have real problems with government efficiency or government's uh, ineffectiveness. What I'm arguing is that we're also uh, suffering from a reputation crisis where citizens think of government as not being effective. And so they tend to pay attention to the things that government doesn't do well and tend not to think about all of the things that government does that are such a routine part of our lives, but that, that we don't even notice them, but that without we wouldn't but so what? I mean, so people think government doesn't perform well. Does that really matter in any fundamental way? It does. does it yeah. So I'm arguing, um, and I find a lot of evidence that part of what happens is the same thing that happens when people lose faith in a company. They withdraw. They don't want to engage mm. with government. And so that means that citizens who have these beliefs that government is just less efficient or less effective or produces much lower quality goods than the private market, when they have the opportunity, they'll take advantage of a private alternative to public So give goods. me some specific examples, yeah. transportation or, yeah, exactly. or education. So or... Um, I think we're seeing a lot of this uh, with dis defection or opting out to um, Uber right, and Lyft to private alternatives to public transportation. And what happens then is pi public transportation has fewer resources to continue providing mm -hmm. public transportation. So fewer people buying tickets to on the subway or on the bus means that they can run fewer routes, mm -hmm. that they're less reliable, and then it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. We see the same thing in public schools. So there's huge variation in quality in public schools and private schools, but in general, people hold the belief that public schools are much lower quality. So citizens who have the resources to opt out of public schools mm -hmm. will do so, particularly those citizens who hold these stereotypes about government. And again, we can imagine all of the ways in which that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy, where you get uh, the sort of skimming of the students with resources out of the public school system. They take with them not only sort of the amount of money that would have gone to the mm -hmm. public schools, but also the participation of their parents who right, tend to be more well-resourced and also um, sort of higher education. And so then the public schools have less money to deliver education. So I think we see a lot of ways in which this reputation crisis really matters for how mm -hmm. government operates. So tell me more about what the evidence is that it's reputation and not performance that's the problem. Yeah, so I, I think it's both, right? So I, I don't think those things are fully independent. Mm -hmm. But 
What we do know is that even in cases where government does a better job performing than the private alternative, we still see people who hold these stereotypes really resistant to engaging on the public side. So it isn't that citizens So you've are, looked at an example. I have. Of where the public sector is actually performing pretty well and people still don't think it's doing a good job? Yeah, so part of what happens is the way that stereotypes work is that people use them as shortcuts for information. Mm -hmm. So what happens is I get some kind of um, service, right? And so this could be municipal services like waste management or it could be um, schools. And, what, and when I get a high quality government service, if I hold this set of beliefs, I'm much more likely to mistakenly believe I'm getting a private service. And so I get this high quality thing from government. And because I believe, well, government doesn't do high quality, mm. I mistakenly believe that it's a private thing, and then I become more supportive of privatizing. So how do you know that's the case, though? I mean, do you have an example where you've actually done some research and I you've do. looked at situations yeah, where... Yeah, so the, the simplest version of this is a study that I did on municipal services. Mm -hmm. So I looked at people who um, receive public services and people who receive private services, mm -hmm. who are totally comparable in terms of their uh, political ideology, their partisanship, their education and income, mm -hmm. but for various reasons, they sort of almost randomly wind up getting either public services or private services. And I look at these in two different situations, one in which we have pretty good evidence that the public option is much more efficient and effective, and one in which the private option is more effective and efficient. And what I find is it doesn't really matter. You see the same patterns where people who hold these negative mm -hmm. stereotypes about government are much more likely to mistakenly believe they get private services if they like the quality of the public services. So if my trash is being picked up and it's being done effectively and there's not litter all around the trash bin, I assume that's got to be a private service because exactly. no government could do that. Exactly, and that seems to be the case in, a, in across a wide variety of services. So I've run some uh, experiments where we let people read a little um, a newspaper article and we vary the policy domain that we're in. So sometimes it's municipal services, sometimes it's education, um, sometimes it's crime control, mm -hmm. um, emergency services, and we give them um, information about the quality of those services. But we don't tell them whether it was publicly or privately provided. And what we find is people infer whether it was public or private. So if we tell them this is a really good, high quality school, and then later we ask them, do you happen to remember whether that was a public school or a private school? They're much more likely to say a private school. Yes, even though they were never even though, Right, exactly. So they're inferring something that's in line right. with the stereotype of what they believe about government. So we've got a problem. So tell me more about what kinds of behavior this leads to that's problematic. I know you've done an experiment in healthcare that's very interesting. Yeah, so with healthcare we looked at whether people who hold these beliefs about government are likely to opt out of, in, of getting health insurance. And this is particularly important after 2010 when we have the, uh, the Affordable Care Act roll out. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing about the Affordable Care Act is it's sort of a public-private partnership, mm -hmm. right? It's government setting up marketplace exchanges where people can purchase private insurance. So we weren't quite sure how this would work. Mm -hmm. But it's also a very partisan area. And so one of the big questions that we had was, is, this, is it just just things like municipal services where there isn't a party identification, right? Republicans and Democrats don't think differently about municipal service mm -hmm. delivery or how, how we should collect garbage. Um, but they do clearly think very differently about the role of the federal government in health insurance. Mm -hmm. So we somewhat reasonably expected that anything re related to these kinds of stereotypes would just be swamped by partisanship, that people would support the Affordable Care Act uh, if they were Democrats and not if they were Republicans. But we found, in fact, that there is obviously a party, a role for party and ideology. And in fact, it goes beyond just support for the ACA. Republicans were less likely to sign up through the healthcare exchanges uh, and more likely either not to sign up for health insurance or so to sign up. So these are needy up. Republicans. Yes. These are folks for whom the health care arguably could be helpful. Mm -hmm. And yet, because they're Republicans, they're less likely to sign up for the Affordable Care Act services, yeah. And, yeah. and sometimes heavily subsidized sub services. Yes, and in fact, part of what we found is the effects are really driven among a subset of Republicans, people who hold these particular stereotypes mm -hmm. of government, which is different from an ideological opposition to government being involved in health insurance. It's the idea that, sure, it would be fine if government were involved, but mm -hmm. they shouldn't be because they can't do it well which is, I think, a really important distinction. So can you 
give me even better evidence that so, okay, you descriptively find that there are people who have these certain kinds of beliefs, both ideological and beliefs about the performance of government, uh, that are less likely to sign up for the Affordable Care Act. Can we be absolutely sure that that's what's going on? And, and do you have any evidence that shows yeah, that so, it really is? Yeah, um, so with a graduate student and a postdoctoral um, student, we ran this set of what we think of as field experiments, mm -hmm. right? Where we go out into the world and we we randomize people mm -hmm. so that we really know that that's what's driving any effect mm -hmm. that we find because we've randomized some kind of treatment. And here the treatment was people who were uninsured and were looking to potentially sign up mm -hmm. for health insurance were assigned either to the healthcare.gov site, which is the government's website which for signing up like for insurance. Which sounds like a government, government right. agency since exactly. it's and, gov and You know, the pictures, it has a picture yeah. of the White House at the bottom, right. and it says, um, you know, calculate your taxes. And so there are various ways, not just the .gov, but right. ways in which it's um, framed as a sort of a public program. Or we assigned them to a private site, healthsherpa.com, which HealthSherpa.com. Healthsherpa Com.com, as we all know, yeah. is uh, tends to be a um, sort of a private mm -hmm. uh, site, and it also had um, instead of pictures of, um, of a little picture of the White House at the bottom, it has a lot of language around consumers and pictures mm -hmm. of people with their doctors, and it's we're specifically here to serve. exactly we're, we're, trying um, to give we're a good serving product. our customers or consumers right. um, and it specifically says that this is not affiliated with government and has no political agenda mm -hmm. and so we randomly assigned people to one of these two sites and then uh, we followed up to see who had signed up for insurance okay but so keep going okay and so what we found is uh, there weren't effects among among Democrats Democrats mm -hmm. who were assigned to these two sites were equally likely to sign up for insurance mm -hmm. What we found is among Republicans, they were much less likely to sign up for insurance if they were assigned to the .gov, .gov site, to the government site. And those effects were largely driven by the subset of Republicans who but hold negative stereotypes. Weren't they getting different products? No, they were getting exactly the same products. So it was the ah, same set of insurance options I that see. you could sign up for. So it wasn't that one set of insurance options was actually higher quality. I see. It was the same options, just framed. So in it's a just the website. Way. I mean, it's just the entry point. Exactly Otherwise, right. you're getting identical things. And it was Obamacare. Yeah. In both cases. Yeah. Okay. Um, and we found how really big were the differences. A, Pretty sizable, so varied in size depending on what subgroup we looked at, but in the neighborhood of seven or eight percentage points less wow. likely. Um, and that's pretty comparable to what we were finding in the mm -hmm. descriptive data about mm -hmm. how much less likely Republicans were to sign up overall. So the solution then is to just make government programs look like private programs and people will sign up. Is that a good solution or is that a problematic solution? Well, so it's part of the solution. There are certainly ways in which government needs to become more mm -hmm. efficient and more effective. We can all come up with recent examples of ways in which government has failed mm -hmm. to fully and effectively solve social problems. But that's not going to be enough. And certainly one of the dangers is then we start to think about what government does in the same way we think of what private companies mm -hmm. do. And so when we think about is the return purely financial, or are there other things that we want government to do that don't necessarily have a financial return? And so one of the things that we argue is where it's possible, we want government to be more efficient, but we also ask government to do a lot of things that we need to think of as collective, mm -hmm. um, and that they may not have returns to us, and they might not even make financial sense, but we all as citizens still want them to be done, and that's why we have government. Okay, when, but is there any way that people could get the notion that government really does serve them better? Are there any? Is there any evidence that when they try it, they like it? Sure. So we have a, um, a one of the chapters of the book, and this is a, again a study I did with a graduate student. Is we look at people who did sign up for uh, for the ACA. So one of the questions again was. If you can get people through to mm -hmm. sign up for insurance, do they adjust their attitudes? And certainly from political science, we have a lot of evidence mm -hmm. to suggest that people are really resistant to changing their attitudes. Mm -hmm. So people tend to ignore information that isn't what they already believe. Right? Um, and, but what we found was when people get health insurance, particularly when they have good experiences with those insurance, their attitudes change. And again, this is concentrated among conservatives and Republicans. Mm. So we, it was among those groups that we saw when people get public provision of insurance, mm. 
they start to like it. And that then changes their levels of support for the kinds of programs that provide those services. So somehow the trick is to get them signed up to know they're getting a government service and deliver a good service, mm -hmm. and then people's attitudes will change. That's part of it. The other thing that we find and that I argue in the book is government needs to do a better job um, selling itself. Um, we think of uh, competition as making it necessary mm -hmm. for private companies to tout their successes. Government tends not to do that. It tends not to help people understand the links between the things that they're getting, the things, in fact, that they take um, quite seriously in their lives that are provided by government. Mm -hmm. For example, there's this great um, story about Grover Norquist, who had a set of... Who's uh, Grover Norquist? A conservative who's been yeah. very sort of um, anti-government, anti-spending. Okay. Um, and he had a set of tweets about his granddaughter who had saved up to buy a guitar. And she goes to the store and she, she can't afford the guitar because she didn't save for the taxes because she, she didn't realize that the mm -hmm. price of the guitar would be more than it was listed because of taxes. And so Norquist sort of pitches this as how Republicans are made, right? That's the hashtag. Right. And one of the, because it's the world of uh, Twitter, um, there's a lot of response along the lines of, yes, but did you remind your daughter that the streets that she drove on to get there were paid for by taxes, or that the street lights are, are paid for by taxes, and all of the ways in which the taxes, having to, the cost of government is really apparent to us, but all of the ways in which government makes our lives healthier and happier uh, are such a, integral part of our lives that we don't even pay attention to so anymore. So can governments actually do this? I mean, for one thing, governments shy away often from too much rhetorical flourish, too much marketing. Um, I'm here at, at the University of California at Berkeley. We actually don't do a lot of marketing, certainly compared to the for-profit universities, and yet we deliver a pretty extraordinary product. Yeah, I think we need to make a better case for why we are doing good for the American public. I think mm -hmm. it's true of public universities. We need to do a better job helping people understand what it is we contribute and how the taxes that they pay help support things that directly benefit them and their communities. Government, on the flip side, also needs to take responsibility when it doesn't do a very good job. It needs to make specific reforms, and it needs to own up to the failures that it makes, help explain to the public why they happened, and take seriously its responsibility to fix them. Do you have an example where a government did this really well? They would sort of said, we blew it, our mistake. Yeah, so I think... To some extent, after the failed launch of the Affordable Care Act websites, it took them longer than it should have to identify those failures mm -hmm. and admit that mm -hmm. they had uh, really screwed up a lot of that This launch. was the website this where people website. would get on and it would take them a, a long time to get on and they couldn't actually figure out how to use the site and so on and so forth. Yeah, right. exactly right. I think it took longer than it should have for them to acknowledge that it was a problem and that they mm -hmm. hadn't done a very good job, but they did eventually. I also think um, after Hurricane Katrina, there was a real reckoning about FEMA and the government's response. It, again, took longer than it should have to make reforms, but I think part of what we saw um, in Houston was that all right, government did a better job responding. Now, we haven't seen that in Puerto Rico for any number of reasons, but it does suggest that government is capable can, of making can get better. fixes and of acknowledging when those fixes so are necessary. So let me change the subject slightly, because you're not only just interested in, in government's reputation, you're really interested in, in how institutions can be made to work better. And you've had a special concern with prisons, and not just with the issue of what they do to the inmates, but also what they do to the correctional officials who actually work there. Can you say a bit about that? Because I think it's an interesting thing that you, you care about both groups in prisons. Often people focus on one or the other. Yeah, so I would say in general, my work is really interested at, and most of what I do is try to figure out how citizens understand their experiences mm -hmm. with government. And for a lot of people, one of the primary experiences they have with government is through criminal justice. This has been true since the 70s, since we saw this massive increase in criminal justice at the same time that we saw some significant retrenchment of the welfare state, which means that a lot of people who are growing up in heavily policed communities, the primary experience they have is through being stopped by police, going to, mm -hmm. um, to the criminal courts, uh, probation and parole and prisons and jails. So one of the things that I have looked at in my own work is what that means for how citizens think about them, their identity, their communities, and their government. 
The other piece of that, of course, is that as we've expanded the criminal justice state, we've also expanded the number of people who work in mm. and around criminal justice. And this is certainly true in prisons, where we've seen this increase in uh, the number of people who are employed mm. as either correctional officers or parole officers or probation, um, and then staff who work in those institutions, as we've seen the rise of mass incarceration. And so. In my research, I've looked at the effects of working in prisons and also being incarcerated on how people think about um, community and the, the sort of how they see government and its role in their lives. So let's start with people working in prisons. Uh, these are often pretty well paying jobs and they often are jobs in rural areas where there's not otherwise much in the way of work. Yeah. Uh, so there's that good feature of them. What's the problem with the jobs? So it can certainly be a very well-paying job. In some states, uh, like California, it's a, a pretty decent job, particularly if you have uh, a fairly low level of education. Mm. But just like a private employers, we need to take seriously that we as citizens employ this group of people. And we put them into situations that we don't adequately prepare them for mm -hmm. and that we don't support them through. So if we think about prisons, we're often thinking about violence and its uh, effects on the people who are incarcerated there, but we don't really discuss or think about the effects that that exposure to violence might have on the people who are working mm -hmm. in those institutions. And these are people who, over the course of their career, frequently spend decades in and out of prisons. And so the overtime exposure to violence and the threat of violence leads to all kinds of unhealthy outcomes, anxiety, depression, suicide risk, and post-traumatic stress and you, disorder. And you've done some uh, really path-breaking surveys to look at people who are the correctional officers and other kinds of employees of prisons to find out what kind of situations they encounter in their private lives that seem to be the result of the situations they encounter in the prisons. I think that's right. So last year we um, put out a survey of correctional officers, parole officers, and correctional staff. And it was a really fascinating study because we were interested in these mental health mm. outcomes but had no idea whether people would be willing to talk to us about them. In part because this is a community that's generally thought of as being um, sort of resistant to talking about their own needs and mm. um, sort of putting up a, um, a macho front, for lack of a better word. Mm. So we put the survey out having no idea what kind of response we would get. And part of what was really striking about the experience mm. of running this survey is people really wanted to talk about this. Mm. We not only received a huge response in terms of returned surveys, but uh, had emails and phone calls from people wanting to share more of their stories, wanting to talk about uh, people that they worked with who had commit suicide, who mm. um, had ex had these experiences at work that had accumulated over time and led to these really terrible outcomes. And so the need, the desire mm -hmm. to talk about these issues and to talk about the pain that they were experiencing and how difficult it was to get support and the kind of support that they need uh, was really striking, just how, how um, how meaningful this right. was to people, to be asked about it for the first time. So that seems like an important contribution to try to understand the difficulties they're facing and to maybe figure out how to ameliorate some of those problems through some kinds of programs or something. Yeah, I think it is. And I, the other interesting thing that happened with this particular survey is once we had completed it and it started to get some attention, we received calls from a lot of other agencies around the country who are also starting mm -hmm. to think about these issues or hadn't started thinking about mm -hmm. these issues until really recently and wanted to talk about the kinds of things that we were doing in California. Uh, the Department of Corrections here in California, the Correctional Officers Union, everybody has really come together to start thinking about these issues, not just because uh, correctional officers and correctional staff are a population we should care about, but because their families are also affected mm -hmm. and because nothing's going to happen in the prisons in terms of uh, productive reforms or healthier environments unless we take seriously correctional officers as humans and individuals who also need support and not just make it a conversation about the people who are incarcerated there. So let's end on now talking about the larger uh, community that uh, faces the return of inmates who have been in prison and what is the impact on the communities that receive lots of people who have been in prison? There's a huge impact in a lot of different domains. So one of the 
um, the real strengths of research on mass incarceration has been what we think of as collateral consequences. Mm -hmm. All of the ways that incarceration leads to negative outcomes, both for individuals and their communities. And the research spans huge numbers of areas. So there are effects on, the, on labor and people's ability to get a job when they're released mm -hmm. and support their families. There are effects on health and both mental and physical health and health outcomes. There are effects on families and children of the people who are incarcerated. Mm -hmm. So part of what we know is there are these massive effects and because incarceration is highly concentrated in particular communities, those communities bear the real brunt. So what kinds of communities are those? So they tend to be urban communities, they tend to be um, heavily minority and low income communities, mm -hmm. communities that often are already struggling with poverty and crime. Um, are, are then doubly affected, not just by the lack of attention to the crime in their communities, but then also by the unintended consequences of trying to address that, that problem through mass incarceration. So this partly gets at America's sort of love-hate relationship with the idea of rehabilitation. Yeah, I think that's right. So since the 1970s, we've really seen a shying away of responsibility for rehabilitation among the criminal, in the criminal justice system. And so we've seen a real reduction in the numbers of programs and supports mm -hmm. that are available for, for people when mm -hmm. they're inside, whether in prisons or jails. At the same time, this population has very high rates of mental illness. They have very high rates of drug and alcohol use. And so I think we're starting to see, particularly with the opioid crisis, a return to conversation about how to support people and not just punish them. Right. Because I mean, we all love the movie that is about the prisoner who comes out and is reformed and does good and does great things. But the truth is a lot of our laws and a lot of our practices don't actually support that kind of thing. I think that's right. I think that's right. And it's a part of the, the real tragedy is just is it's such a waste of human potential. Mm -hmm. So there are extraordinary people who are working really hard, both inside and outside prison, to support people coming out. And part of what we find is that if you can give people the right supports, they can do extraordinary things when they come out. So part of what we're seeing now is a network of people who are formerly incarcerated who are really helping to um, establish programs for their peers when they come out of prison uh, and are really leading the way in a lot of these domains to change the conversation. And that presumably will affect the reputation of the criminal justice system. So we're getting back to reputation now and maybe give it a better reputation for actually solving problems and not just being a warehousing place where we put people who we think are criminals. That's the hope, that criminal justice reform, particularly in a broader conversation about the kinds of positive things that government can do around uh, K through 12 education and, um, and su supporting working families, all of these things, if we can do them well and make it clear to people that this is something that government can have a really positive role in, I do think we can solve a lot of social problems or at least get started on problems that for a long time have been with us and really need our attention. Well, thank you, Amy Lerman, uh, for telling us about how the reputation problem is something we should be concerned about, but also for telling us how we might be able to solve some of the problems uh, that uh, exist because of government not performing the way it should perform, and for giving us a, a bit of hope about the future. Thank you. Thank you.